Yeah. Um, so I grew up in a fairly conservative place. I grew up in Hong Kong. Um, and a lot of kind of like the friends that I found uh, were folks on the internet because a lot of the times when I was like talking to people um, who like went to school with me and stuff like that, um, they were all they weren't folks who really understood what I like really was feeling or what I really understood uh, stood about myself and the world around me. Um, and so I kind of went on the internet and made a bunch of friends. Uh, as I think a lot of people kind of can relate to. Um, and uh, with that, like, I kind of saw the virtual world as a place where I could really um, kind of explore what it really meant for me to be me. Um, like the internet and games were the first places where I start, first started presenting as male because uh, I'm, I'm trans mass. Um, my name essentially came from like a quick panic of, hey, I need to make like a username, like a new username for this game that I'm joining. What should I do? What's a cool guy name? Uh, and I just off the top of my head, I was like, oh, Zach sounds kind of cool, so I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> um, and then it kind of stuck. Uh, so for me, like kind of digital expression uh, as well, where I could literally be anyone who I wanted, I could dress my avatar up however I wanted, um, I could code my MySpace layout to look like whatever I wanted. <laughs> um, all of those things uh, meant that I could really uh, be the best version of myself that I thought I could be. Um, it also really led to kind of like my career uh, paths and stuff like that. I, I mentioned like my MySpace layout. Uh, I uh, I kind of made a bunch of like layouts for MySpace, Tumblr, Zanga. Uh, that was where I first learned about design. That's where I first started putting together kind of visual things, learning how to kind of make them with technology. Um, and now I work in tech as a designer. <laughs> so a lot of it was definitely very formative for me. And it all kind of came from the fact that like the physical world wasn't really matching what I needed in terms of what I needed, so uh, what I needed socially, what I needed to feel comfortable in my own skin and all of that. Wow. So you, you started very early on kind of in this digital space and have grown through this evolution of uh, in like your virtual identity and how people perceived you from the early stages where you had MySpace or chat profiles where it was nothing but a name and a bio uh, in, into where people perceived you purely based on a name, purely based on the way that you create this profile and have come all the way to today where we have avatars and virtual spaces and we're allowed to be in these 3D worlds where we are, are immersed in exactly who and what we want to be. Um, what point did you realize that this was something that you wanted to do as a career? Yeah, I, I guess um, for me, I don't think I really could see myself being super passionate about anything else. Um, like, I was making Neopets layouts with like Photoshop and HTML CSS when I was like starting at like seven years old. Um, and, and like, I um, also was making stuff in like Photoshop and stuff like that, even before then, just trying out new things. I mean, none of it was very good to clarify, like seven year old me was not like an amazing designer or anything like that. Um, but it was kind of like I enjoyed making things and there aren't a lot of kind of careers where you can really make things. You can have like control over how everything appears. Um, and like, I feel like I could have definitely gone on the path of like, potentially going like the engineering route, but I didn't think that that felt like I had enough kind of like agency over things. 
um, like I did really well in school. I wasn't like um, my mom was very disappointed when I decided to go to art school and not like uh, more broader university. <laughs> um, so like yeah, it was kind of just like I didn't know what else um, like. I really wanted to do. I just knew that, like, I was spending hours and hours just making my own, like, Tumblr layouts and stuff like that, and breaking things and having fun breaking things. That's awesome. So, in terms of, uh, for a lot of the viewers here, um, we're joined by guests of all ages. Uh, yeah. It sounds like you, along with a lot of the people here, are you've been all over the world you've uh you're not someone who's just centrally located in uh the u.s so you've yeah. you've started uh, abroad in hong kong you said so for those of us and in, in the audience who, who might be from other places in the world what did your educational journey look like yeah i guess like here all like fully um fully caveat this with like I was definitely very privileged so I grew up in Hong Kong and Filipino I went to a British international school growing up um, from primary school through secondary school uh, so British curriculum but the teachers were pretty great with supporting me with pretty much everything <laughs> um, like and so we were really pushed to kind of figure out who are you and like what are the things that you really care about and also pushing uh, pushing us to like think about like the wider world and i also grew up in a very international community so i was surrounded by folks from like all different cult kind of cultures um so i'm very comfortable navigating that i mean like international student life um especially in like asia is a very specific type of way that you grow up um but uh, yeah, so that like from there, I went to college in the U.S. Uh, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design for graphic design. Hey, RISD. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm from uh, Rhode Island. I'm in Rhode Island right now. Oh, red. Oh, red. I'm just uh, I'm just outside of Boston now. Um, but yeah, I went to RISD for graphic design. Uh, admittedly, kind of hated the the program itself because it was very like looking back i really appreciate a lot of it but it was very traditionally focused so when i was in school i made a ton of like books a lot of print things uh but i knew like especially growing up like i spent all my time doing things digitally that's kind of where i wanted to live and i knew that so i spent a lot of time doing not school work like doing the minimum to get decent grades for uh, for school and focus a lot of my er energy on like learning digital skills like outside of class doing a bunch of like extracurriculars um i was on like the organizing committee for a hackathon when i was in school um so and then basically learned all about like the tech industry like what does it take to get an internship um Internships in tech also were very nicely paid a lot of the time. So it meant that I could go to San Francisco for a summer and kind of live there uh, and be essentially funded and be able to save a ton of money by doing one summer internship. Um, so yeah, there, there's definitely like a lot of definitely privilege involved in knowing uh, in being in places mm -hmm. where you're kind of presented with all the resources that you can want like maybe they're not going to like hand it to you uh but it's all there for you to take um like you mentioned brisd it's it's a very good school that means it gets approached by a lot of companies who want to hire its graduates um so if you go to the career fairs like they're not going to force you to go to the career fairs but if you do go you can potentially make a lot of connections and I've been fully like uh, I'm I'm fully like transparent about this. Like my first job was in VR, and that is not at all common uh, for for many people. A lot of times, VR 
you're looking to be more of a senior level to get even hired in the field in the first place because a lot of the teams are very small they don't generally have a lot of bandwidth to um kind of train juniors a lot of the time uh there might be like some smaller com uh, some companies that might be bigger enough to be able to support that but for the most part you need to be able to do at least some tasks uh to a good enough level to go into production and all of that without a lot of hand holding um so the way that i got my job was really like i got connected to a bunch of like um recruiters uh from a venture capitalist company andreessen and horowitz one of the largest ones who came to RISD because they knew that RISD had a good design program um so i got connected with them kept bumping into them with all the various things that i was involved in so we got like a pretty good connection and they helped place me like introduce me to one of their portfolio companies which is within um which is where i got my first job um, and I'm pretty sure there wasn't originally like a really large position open for me, really. Uh, but because I got the introductions, I was like fully supported by like the VC firms. They were like, oh, like, let's give him a shot, essentially. Uh, it took a couple of months to even get to that point. But my first industry job was kind of like, hey, they kind of have a need. For, for a designer, not super well defined, um, but hey, why not? Uh, and so I got my first job uh, out in LA doing VR stuff. I started very small, like most junior designers, doing like little thumbnails for <laughs> 360 videos. Uh, but essentially, over my three years there, ended up leading essentially the entire UX for Supernatural. Um, because startups just hand you things and like tell you to go figure that out. Um, so, like, definitely, I've had a, a much easier journey. I think of getting into the industry than a lot of folks. I think it's definitely still possible to get into the industry. Uh, you just, you know, have to be able to show off a portfolio or something like that. Um, that is of a quality that could go into production very easily, um, which is obviously easier to say than is to actually do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the good thing is with Apple's announcement, I fully expect a lot of companies are just going to be like, hey, we need more like XR folks. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's just going to be a lot more jobs open. Um, yeah, it's, it's a whole new world that's opening up. And, uh, and not just that, when you have something like Apple come into the VR space, companies are now coming in with a larger amount of capital, whereas before when yeah. we're kind of in this very beta universe um, where everything is, is new and there's a lot of passion, but not as much capital. Once you have someone like Apple coming into the, to the market, now larger companies are going to have involvement which brings significant more resources, more jobs that are like quality paying. And now there's an opening within this field. So for those of you, if this is something that you want to get in, um, something that I and, think and I would say, like, you spoke to that was, uh, yeah, I mean, that, one that thing was that very, very important sorry, is being worldly. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, <laughs> but I think what's amazing for everyone here is 10 years ago, all these people from all over the world weren't able to to meet and socialize uh, in the yeah. way that was influential for you in your younger years. Um, fast forward to today, like the the scope of what we're capable of doing to come together to meet people virtually has enabled people. Like if you're not in a major hub like Los Angeles or uh, New York or go somewhere like like RISD, um if you're not in a a, a huge hub uh, you can still make these connections here and i i think okay. like it's it's amazing that you're able to tell that story but i want to kind of segue into uh, this has been a long journey for you both in terms of your your career but also gender identity so this is yeah. something that's been a, a 15 year journey that you've been on which is significantly longer than than most of us in, in the audience today 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I've definitely, like, I've been out since I was, like, fairly young. Um, like, I'm pretty sure I first came out to somebody uh, as soon as I found out, like, what trans meant when I was, like, something like 12 years old. Uh, I'm currently 28. Um, so it, it's been a while, and, uh, like, I've been out and, like, not doing a lot of like medical transitioning work until like about 2015 when i started t um but yeah i've been i've been out and it's definitely been a journey uh i i will say one of the really big things that like made a difference was when i moved to college because i was no longer living with family um mm -hmm. like i think for me and i guess like for a lot of folks like family is definitely like a touchy uh mm -hmm thing like my family is definitely not at least my parents were not like the most supportive um so even though i came out to them uh when i was like about 16 or whatever um they kind of like actively chose not to like acknowledge that or under or try to understand that so when i moved off to college it was like oh like i'm immediately changing my name on like i was actually one of the first folks at RISD who um, used the preferred name kind of field. They couldn't change a lot of things because I was an international student, so legally they have to keep a lot of the like actual legal documentation there, uh, mm -hmm. but they implemented like a preferred name field so I could get my email address uh, to, to have my name on it. Um, I could appear on the like the class lists and stuff uh with with my name um there were a few hiccups because new systems sometimes people like export from a strange place for their class list or whatever and they didn't accommodate for that uh so there were a few like little bumps but when i moved to college it was like the first place where like i didn't have to like tell people uh they would just understand that like i am who i present that uh, who i present myself as um, and from there, uh, it also meant that, like, I had the space, uh, I, I actually started TU when I was in college, because there were, like, resources available. Rhode Island is pretty good, uh, with helping with a lot of medical stuff, um, so I got connected with a lot of those resources, um, also got connected with, like, a local trans group. Uh, so I had, like, a little bit more of a support network, um, and, yeah, and then from there, when I went and got my job, uh, I had, like, pretty good health insurance, so, like, all the medical stuff was kind of taken care of, like, I had top surgery and stuff, uh, I had top surgery and a revision, literally all I paid was, like, $300 for the two admissions, um, so... Like, for me, it's definitely been, like, a, a long journey. I would say, like, my parents are still not really supportive. Um, I'm kind of okay, like, I've learned to be okay with it. Uh, part of it's acknowledging that, like, even if things go, like, smoothly on your end, the people around you might not, still might not take it the right way or, like, aren't going to meet you at your level and, a lot of times you just have to be like learn to kind of live with that because you can't really change always um what people are, are going to think or say or anything like that so um for me it's just been like very low contact with my parents <laughs> um but i mean i i consider myself pretty lucky um i've definitely made it pretty far <laughs> um and I think it's always good to, like, keep in the back of your head that, like, things can always get better. Um, because, like, looking back, uh, I definitely went through, like, lots of periods of, I guess, like, pretty bad depression and things like that. And in the moment, it's very hard to even think about kind of, like, what does my future look like? Uh, how do I plan for the future when I can't get over this, like, this little hump or this large hump or whatever? Um, but, yeah, I've, I've gone to the point where, like, 
being trans for me a lot of the time is like it's important but it it doesn't come up as often anymore um like dysphoria isn't kicking my ass every day <laughs> and, and all of that so yeah that's amazing um you know i think it's it's wonderful for anybody who can kind of turn it from being the entirety of your life to just a part of your life um to, to where it allows you to to focus really focus on your passions and your interests even if they come together and, and become part of one and the same um as you work in the vr xr field how has uh, kind of gender identity molded into uh your work and your your interest i know that that's something that you explore deeply yeah um so a lot of it like uh on one end i have all of my kind of like personal work, like I mentioned, I did uh, a little study uh, that was all done in my free time and like definitely wasn't being paid or funded in any way, but I was like, hey, this is something that I'm pretty passionate about. Um, so I like, like I'm in VR because I, I like love the medium. I love what it is. Um, so that just means I spend some, some of my free time doing it. Um, uh, on the other side, uh, on my like more professional slash stuff I'm actually paid to do by my job, um, a lot of times what it comes out of, but like uh, how it comes out in a lot of those things is really being an advocate for folks in the trans community whenever I design something, or even on the broader scale, like under uh, being more able to understand the ways that gender kind of plays into a lot of choices and decisions, even if we don't mean them to be. So like I like I worked at two fitness VR companies. Um and fitness VR in particular um is a and fitness in general is a lot to do about like feeling yourself in your own body and feeling like a lot of times feeling uncomfortable in your body because you're working out, you're exercising, you're exerting yourself. It kind of sucks. I'm not the biggest like exercise fan. Um, and so like when I'm doing a lot of that design work um, of figuring out, okay, how do we position this? How do we ask people for information? What information do we give them? Uh, how do we pose it in a way that makes them feel comfortable in their own skin? um that's where i see a lot of like where being trans like really informs the decisions that i make um and when uh when i was working especially on the ux for supernatural because i was doing a lot of it so i had a lot of hand in like how things were formed um some of those things like not even asking for gender for example uh, at all um when they're signing up for an account a lot of fitness apps for example use gender as a way to inform like how many calories are you burning um but for for supernatural we wanted to de-emphasize the idea that like calories are being burned and feeling and emphasizing more um feeling comfortable moving in your own body feeling comfortable in your own skin so it was like why do we even need to ask gender or anything like that um and doing things like making sure people understand that like hey we're not shoving a lot of information in your face a lot of the information that we're doing is competing with yourself as opposed to competing with like everybody else so a lot of it's uh like the, the scoring system for example is based off like your own personal effort and your history of effort um in the past like how uh your power, um, your power metric is based on the last couple of times that you've played Supernatural. So, um, really, the only person that you're competing with is against yourself, not some arbitrary like number that we've decided. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of that again is to do with like understanding that people come into these experiences from different places and being able to to kind of meet them where they're at as opposed to prescribing things um, and telling them what they should be. <laughs> um, and I think that's a pretty uh, pretty big um, kind of trans narrative is like, 
you aren't always going to be in the box that everyone expects you to be. So how do people meet you where you're at as opposed to like prescribing things onto you? Um, and that's kind of the way that I want to approach design a lot of the time is figuring out um, how do we get people to be the best version of themselves and like just kind of polish that and meet them where they're at in that sense uh, as opposed to having an idea of like who the best type of person is or who the best type of like uh, player is or whatever. Um. Mm -hmm. and i think that's uh, you you kind of talk about this topic um of inclusion within a corporate space and i think that that's something it, where companies can learn that it's very important to have people who have life experience like living the uh, the difficulties um, that their consumer base is going to have. And when you have uh, kind of inclusion within a workspace, it allows them to grow as a company because they are able to meet the needs of a wider demographic. And I think that that is something yeah. that, that you are doing uh, very well, which we're, of, of course, all, all grateful to have these products that uh, are, are better able to meet our needs. Um, yeah. Something that you've talked quite a bit uh, well, not quite a bit, a little bit about is this study that you did. And I was wondering if you could yeah. talk more about what the focus of your study was, um, where you collected data from, and what your results were. Yeah, so I um, uh, I basically did a, a large survey where I posted in a couple of places, including Trans Academy, um, where I basically wanted to learn a little bit more about what are the both benefits and negatives uh, that people have kind of like identified um, and are there uh, in, in their use of like social VR when, as it relates to things like gender um, and gender presentation and all of that? Um, and are there any like really large commonalities? Um, because I think a lot of times when, we're, when I'm looking at like VR studies, um, there's not as much emphasis on folks who um, who I guess like cross expectations or anything like that and like being trans myself knowing like with my history um, I was kind of curious to see like is VR a place that uh, like the trans experience or just like being able to explore gender is something that uh, happens I mean I know it happens but in what ways does it happen what ways are people finding like to connect with each other how do they kind of think about themselves um and, and a lot of this was based off of as well like other research that i seen but and was very interested in but was interested in seeing it in practice um so uh i guess if a couple of more detailed things things like uh, the Proteus effect, in uh, which was done by, I'm going to forget the name off the top of my head right now. Uh, oh, Nick Yee, uh, who is a Stanford researcher. And this was like a study that came out in like 2008 or whatever, um, where it showed, uh, where he kind of showed that um, we usually think of like avatars as, as this one way thing where you, uh, you decide what your avatar is and that's what it is. But uh, he, he kind of showed that it's a two-way street, that your avatar, whatever you decide, um, actually influences the way that you behave. So people, uh, he showed that people who were uh, given like taller avatars, for example, performed more confidently and more aggressively in uh, kind of negotiation tactics. Um, so like things like embodiment and avatars, like how does that influence the way that you see the world around you? Um, was something that was really interesting to me. Uh, I also saw um, a little study by Michelle Cortez, who's another VR designer, um, where I'm, I think her pronouns are she, her, uh, I can't remember, but um, she basically went into VR chat and talked to a lot of um, cis men who were wearing like cute little like female avatars, which is very common in VR chat, and kind of asked them like, 
who like why are you doing this like what is <laughs> what are the benefits and a lot of the responses were kind of terrible but the underlying kind of reasons that she found were like it gave a lot of cis men the the kind of room to express themselves in a way that they didn't feel comfortable with their own body um because when like they felt restrained by being like a male it wasn't good to like be creative it wasn't good to be expressive or show emotion so they use it as a way to kind of get around that which definitely has some hints of like a little bit of sexism involved but at the same time it shows that like people are using these spaces as a way to push themselves in ways that uh, they didn't feel comfortable doing in their own skin um so seeing all of that i was like hey like i'm trans i know that like growing up on the internet was very influential in the way that like i saw the world so what how is vr kind of doing that in a different way so yeah i did the survey and i found like a couple of things which definitely backed up a lot of uh some of the other studies i was reading where folks were coming in and saying like yeah like vr chat decreased my dysphoria because i felt embodied in this and i felt like this was my own body um and i could look look at myself and i could literally be anything that i wanted in a way that didn't cause me discomfort um which i think like a lot of us like know about like that's why we choose our avatars um but what was also very interesting to me was the the vast number of folks who also sh um talked about like yeah being in like social vr um influenced the like my own personal growth uh in many ways like i learned to be more confident i learned how to be more outgoing i learned uh how to socialize with people better um like i learned social skills um also things like i learned more things about technology that like i didn't realize i couldn't do beforehand like i mean vr chat is what it is but it's also it's also a very technical tool um i think in my survey and it wasn't even like a vr chat focused survey although i'm pretty sure a lot of folks use vr chat because it's the largest uh kind of social network uh but i think it was something like 98 percent of folks used like advanced avatar customizations so something that required them to open up a different program usually unity or blender um and like put in their avatar in some capacity, which is like an industry skill that is pretty hard mm. to teach and learn. Um, yeah. And just the fact that they wanted to, to customize themselves was their kind of driving very force. Similarly, very similarly for you in your early days is how MySpace yeah. forced us all to learn some HTML code to be able to create these customized profiles. And a lot of people found themselves into enjoying um, creating online and code and uh, found themselves into their profession and their career path through that experience that they were kind of forced uh, by using and customizing MySpace. I think that VR chat is doing a lot of that today for people who are using, uh, you know, Unity and Blender and all of the tools that come together to create these wonderful virtual spaces. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's also another reason why I was so excited by, like, VR in the first place, because, uh, a lot of times it felt like it was going back to the times of the internet where things weren't so fully defined, and, and you could essentially decide what the platform was and figure out, like, what are the things that really serve you? Because right now on the internet and, like, with apps and stuff, like, platforms are not at all flexible <laughs> for what you want, like, mm -hmm. you're only allowed this amount of space you have to fit yourself within this type of box uh you don't really get to do like behaviors or anything like that um and vr chat is obviously the most like uh the most customizable of most of the most popular like social networks but even things like rec room for example with their like maker pen or whatever it's called teaching kids how to uh how to do coding and doing things like for loops and stuff that like um a lot of kids struggle with when they're in like cs programs um mm -hmm. and we also know like it, it's been shown that vr is very good for doing things like training um 
so yeah, like being able to um, get folks uh, into a virtual space where we know that like them doing things spatially and being able to experience stuff helps them learn better, um, I think is like really awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, like that, that customizability was something that like got me really excited uh, about VR in the first place. Um, awesome. So we've, we've kind of covered um, the early days of digital spaces uh, leading us to the present. What do you see for the future of VR and XR um, digital spaces? And what do you want to see for that future? Because I know those can be two very different places. Yeah. Um, I guess... For me, I'm a little bit hesitant about the like <laughs> the future of like XR spaces um, because for for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is there is a huge push, especially within the industry, to go to more towards like um, AR or MR uh, kind of worlds where you like see the world around you and stuff like that. Um, for me, a lot of the like magic of VR. Uh, is the fact that you can you don't have to see everything around you, um, but I mean it is more useful for like productive things like uh, any productivity apps or whatever, um, which I guess is like the the next logical step for a lot of more productivity based things, which like with Apple seems to be the the kind of direction where a lot of folks want to be heading. Uh, they want to make the next big app that will be productive, revolutionize the way people connect, and all of those things. Um, there are positives with that, like especially with Apple's system, because it solves a lot of problems that things like connecting to your accounts, because typing in VR is awful. Um, so I think there are some positive aspects of that. I think it's about to be a lot more connected, uh, just for the facts that you can easily connect all the ways that you live digitally, which I am pretty excited about. Um, but I am kind of like a little bit hesitant on the kind of like MR functionalities and stuff like that, because I think we are going to lose a little bit of that magic. Um, in terms of where I would like to see it go, um, I, I want to see more powerful worlds that are aimed at really, really benefit people and help people be better. Um, I mean, currently a lot of it's like a focus in uh, a lot of VR cards, like you can do more and that's not the kind of like way I see a lot of folks using VR is like training, like, oh, we can do diversity training, which is all like good and awesome very good again for teaching people things that they should be taught um but i want to see more things around like just designing experiences where people can show up and maybe they are more confident in that space so you teach them those things um without them even necessarily noticing a lot of that um being able to show up in a space um and really playing to things that like vr is very good with um there uh one of my like things i keep trying to push is this idea that like because everyone in a virtual world is technically in their own kind of like instance they all kind of see and perceive things differently it's never going to be like one-to-one -one. uh you can theoretically draw something in inside of the world that targets like every single person in that world separately. So um, I'm trying to do this without referencing work, uh, but uh, I don't know. The, the worst case situation of this is like advertising. So you go into a world and uh, you get someone who like talks to you and they can talk directly at you and it can be customized to everything. Um, that you do, and it doesn't have to reflect on anybody else because it's being drawn separately for everybody. Um, so they can essentially sell you the, 
like the best solution, which is definitely not the solution I like. I hate, I, I really hate advertising. Uh, but imagine if you were in like a show or something and for everybody in the audience, um, the performer can reach out and they can reach out to you in particular. Um, and everybody feels like the performer is reaching out to them. Um, what kind of situations can you create that enable the feelings of like intimacy and connection uh, as opposed to being in this like large world where everything is so separate? <laughs> um, a lot of VR worlds right now are built to be very, very large. Um, I think it's great. I think it's mm -hmm. aspirational. Uh, but what about designing smaller, more intimate spaces? How do you design for connection? Yeah. I, I think that it's, that's a very interesting topic to have about virtual architecture and design. Um, funny enough, um, our next guest after you is Leia Liu, um, the creator of Audio Link. And kind of early pandemic days, um, she was developing an environment, uh, like a world called the Catgirl Penthouse. And uh, I kind of kind of helped with the, the design elements of that. And we talked a lot about virtual architecture architecture, and how you can create spaces um, designed to, to feel intimate in a larger space. And, and for me personally, where I learned a lot of design that helped influence um, is actually studying casino architecture where you're in enclosed spaces and they are designed to show you multiple spaces that you want to go to to separate people from all coming together in one huddled area. Um, and I think that as we expand in the future, there's going to be a lot more design elements that come into play when we're in larger open world spaces, when computers and graphics are able to handle that. And we design them to separate people into little areas to still maintain the intimacy in a wider open space. Yeah, um, I definitely think like for me, the feelings of like intimacy can sometimes be uh, not as important in a lot of VR experiences, um, like even a lot of the social ones. Um, it tends to be like large kind of like uh, expanses of spaces, but even when they are closer together, it's like, how do you really design for like pro social kind of behavior as opposed mm -hmm. to just like dropping everybody in <laughs> and hoping for yeah. the best? Um, right now, I think, like, again, like it's VR early days, so we're all trying to figure it all out. So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's like a very like the industry is not that super new it's been around for a little bit um but we are still kind of getting to a point where we're finally getting a lot of people into spaces um so kind of the dynamics change. Mm -hmm. and and i think that we are seeing improvement just something for um that really improved this space just vr chat and all is you, you jump into a world but allowing us to have earmuffs I think is yeah. just a, a very wonderful tool that allows us to be in a room with a lot of people and to control how we want to to create that environment. And we're going to see more of these tools um, as we develop, as we create together. And I think that you're really kind of leading the path forward, which I'm super excited to see the work that you do and, and where VR and XR takes us in the future, particularly in, in safe uh, inclusive hands that that come to bring us all together um yeah. so we have to kind of wrap things up here because we're, we have yeah. quite a busy schedule today but i yeah. want to thank you very much for joining us today and for people in the audience in front of us and online uh watching the stream or on youtube later where can uh everyone find you to follow you and your work yeah, uh, so um, I'm on Twitter, uh, unfortunately. Uh, my username is Z-K-D-O-C-A-D-I-Z, -D -D so my last name. If you Google me, it should come up. Um, I have a very distinctive last name. So yeah, Google me, and it should come up. Um, otherwise, I'm also in the Trans Academy Discord very, very occasionally, but if people ping me, I'll usually respond. 
Uh, and I'm very happy to just chat in general with folks. So yeah, like definitely reach out. Uh, my email is definitely out there if you want to find it. Again, if you Google me, everything should pop up. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure for us to have you here. I want to thank you once more time. Everybody, please give it up for Zach Diakadis. Thank you so much for having us today.